The Nine Inch Nails soundtrack for Quake was a pure passion project. According to frontman Trent Reznor, he didn't do it for the money or for expanding his audience. He just loved id Software's games. You heard that right, industrial rock band, the group behind tracks like Closer, The Hand That Feeds, Head Like a Hole, and Hurt, composed an iconic, ambient, industrial, experimental rock album for friendship. Or, as former id developer, Quake level editor, and sound designer American McGee recalls, id and Nine Inch Nails formed a friendship that was based on mutual interests playing games and music. Uh, it was just a strange stroke of luck. I happened to move into an apartment complex uh, in which John Carmack also lived. The guy who created Doom. The guy, yeah, who created Doom. And, uh, he and I became friends. Uh, a couple months went by and he offered me a job and I did answering the phones. Quake has made a bit of a resurgence as of late, in part thanks to Night Dive Studios' incredible port to modern systems. The remastered port is absolutely worth a purchase, but more importantly to this conversation, Night Dive's Quake release finally makes it easier for gamers to play Quake without having to mod the game to include the soundtrack. In fact, Nine Inch Nails have made the soundtrack commercially available for the first time ever on both streaming platforms and vinyl. The frontman of Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor, attributes his relationship with video games through a memory of playing 1978's Space Invaders. Out here we entertain ourselves at home, so we got an Atari video game. There's so many different games to play. We especially like Space Invaders. The Atari classic was a launching point for the musician's lifelong relationship with sci-fi action titles, which eventually blossomed into Reznor's adoption of PC gaming. In Benedict Canyon, at the Los Angeles address of 100050 Yellow Drive, also known as the infamous Tate House, Reznor and bandmates would nurture their obsession of id software games via the revolutionary Wolfenstein 3D. In an interview with journalist Kevin Keating, recalling the days at Le Pig Studio, a reference to Charles Manson's blood-soaked messages etched on Sharon Tate's wall, Nine Inch Nails band member and composer Chris Vrenna paints a vivid picture of a typical Nine Inch Nails morning. Vrenna explains, We had a PC there and Wolfenstein 3D Spear of Destiny had just come out. That became our addiction for like a month and every morning we'd wake up, we'd get a cup of coffee, and we'd play that next level. Trent would drive, I would navigate, I'd be like, nope, 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 it was down the hallway to the right. February 1st of 91 is when we formed id Software, the four of us. It's three-dimensional, it's texture map, it's Wolfenstein, one of the hottest selling computer games in the world, in which BJ Blastowitz storms a Nazi bunker in search of Adolf Hitler. Prior to Wolfenstein 3D and its sequel, Spear of Destiny, Reznor, like many other musicians, had been operating in Mac's ecosystem. Trent crossed over from Mac to PC's video game-centric offerings after discovering that games like Wolfenstein existed. We told them what we were doing, and they are like, don't stir up that World War II thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they were just like, you know, we're, you're, you're mowing down Nazis with a chain gun and stuff. It's really cool. <laughs> And they were just, you know, they went and they, they, they couldn't believe, you know, it was made major controversial and they, they you know, they were really scared, but they, we, we did really good with our other games. So they're like, okay. It's no surprise that Reznor, a fan of cutting edge graphic detail and tight mouse and keyboard controls, later linked up with video game developer superstar John Romero and the Texas based developers at id Software's Dallas HQ. The original Doom was a really significant jump in gaming technology for the time. We were making really big strides almost every single game every year. And Doom was a really significant kind of inflection point for things because all of a sudden the world was vivid enough that normal people could look at a computer game and understand what computer gamers were always excited about. The creators of the first-person, demon-shooting, video game sensation called Doom were known to the world as id Software. The name of the company was a nod to Sigmund Freud, and the small group was founded by four former soft disk developers, including the hallowed duo of John Romero and John Carmack. Alongside creative director and designer Tom Hall and artist Adrian Carmack, the id Software team followed Doom with their highly anticipated smash hit franchise Quake. A very loose story that we're working with through the development of the, of the game. There's this one 
controlling bad guy who's sending entities through time to collect things, technology. Um, that, that story is probably going to change a bunch of times before it's actually released. Uh, but that's the premise that we're running with right now. From a medieval protagonist to a Lovecraftian antagonist, Quake's development cycle initially failed to launch in 1991 with its video game conceptual reimagining of a John Carmack original character called Quake. Quake was placed inside of the famous programmer's Dungeons and Dragons campaign, where Carmack DM'd the group of id developers as they roleplayed together inside of his massive imaginative world. The title of their video game would be called Quake, the Fight for Justice. The prototyping process spanned several weeks before the team ultimately decided that the tech was not quite ready for the type of immersive experience the developers hoped to deliver to their loyal player base. In a conversation shared by Quake Expo, Romero explained that, quote, Originally, the game was going to be much more like an adventure or experience. You traveled through a full 3D world with your massive hammer, which increased in power as you defeated enemies, much like Link's sword in the Zelda series. That was the idea, but there was never any game code to prove out the idea, so we reached a boiling point where some of the dev team was very worried that we wouldn't be able to release the game within a year after our first year of development, and they started to freak out. We held a vote, and the vote was to just slap in Doom-style weapons and polish it off and get it out the door. So I rewrote the design, defined the weapons, level order, etc., and we just plowed through it and released it on June 22nd, 1996. A courtship of freaks and geeks commenced between id's ragtag band of debaucherous developers and Nine Inch Nails' gothic rock stars. Both teams shared similar sensibilities with a penchant for the strange, twisted, and violent imagination within each other's work. As American McGee recalls, quote, it all started with the facts that anachronistic precursor to the digital wave upon which our games and music rode into the 90s. Nine Inch Nails is coming to Dallas and the developers at id Software are invited to the show. The id offices were a frequent stage to Trent's music." End quote. Trent Reznor actually came to the studio and all the people went out to eat with them and I didn't for some reason and I can't remember why I didn't but maybe I should have. So they went out and they had some other guys there and when they were out at dinner American McGee, who was along with him, had PCP put into his drink, into his drink, and he got like really sick and had to go home, and he was sick for the next day. We don't know who stuck American with the PCP. We know it was not Trent Reznor or any of his guys. There was a claim that it was someone from Pantera because they were there too, but I don't know. Programming wizard John Carmack and Co. were fans of spinning bands like Nine Inch Nails at the Office. Carmack told YRB that quote the new lighting and level design capabilities were leading us in a direction even more dark and moody than Doom, and you could say we were already inspired by the Nine Inch Nails CDs in heavy rotation at the office." End quote. When the band of developers were in their darkest days, Romero recalled missing the times of shared community music sessions. In fact, a quiet id office was never a good sign. Music is and always has been integral to the developers' biggest high-action-packed games. Not unlike his peers in Texas, Trent Reznor's belief was that gaming created an opportunity for his team to step out from under the immense pressures of songwriting and music production. Whether on tour or in the studio, the band always made time for gaming with each other. The first time I'd seen Doom and played Doom, um, it came at a very inopportune time where we were, uh, I just finished the Downward Spiral album and um, our keyboard player at the time walked in with uh, the shareware of Doom that halted any sort of work we were getting done. They put a game out that really catered to my taste. It seemed politically incorrect and it seemed violent and it seemed like a, uh, a game that couldn't have been made by a giant company. It was fun, it was um, addicting. It really just struck a chord with me. The we don't give a shit attitude, that's one of the things that made it great. John Romero and partner Jay Wilbur are hard at work playing games. They consider it research. When the latest game comes out, that's real cool new technology. We're already way past that because of the research we've been doing during the development of the game. Id's next game would provide Trent the opportunity to place his creative stamp on the Texan game developer's next franchise. Trent's credits would later include composer, sound designer, and the voice of the playable character, the Ranger. But before a collaborative partnership could be forged through the creation of Quake, 
Nine Inch Nails and id Software would first fuse their love of each other's art by meeting their mutually respected counterparts. Trent Reznor and his group joined the Quake team at the beginning stages of the game's development, around the time of Doom 2's release in 1994. Chris Vrenna, who would later go on to compose American McGee's Alice and id Software's Doom 3 and Quake 4, explained how the two teams met. Trent and I were both big gamers back in the day, and we were really into the first-person shooters. On our first tour buses, we would bring two old-school, at the time, they were state-of-the-art, 486-chip PCs. We'd put one in the front lounge, one in the back lounge, and connect them via a coax LAN so that we could play death matches. The bond shared between video game developer and Rockstar led Trent to visit id's Texas-based office. At this point, Trent enjoyed the opportunity to peel back the curtain while observing the different roles each individual developer played at the studio, the id developers would drive the members of the band on Dallas freeways in sports cars doing speeds up to 140 miles per hour. Mr. Fly Yellow Ferrari. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have some cars and... <laughs> In turn, when American McGee would make his trips out to New Orleans, Nine Inch Nails would find their own ways to display their hospitality. The bond shared between video game developer and Rockstar led Trent to visit id's Texas-based office. At this point, Trent enjoyed the opportunity to peel back the curtain while observing the different roles each individual developer played at the studio. Chris Vrenna of Nine Inch Nails recalled, quote, Trent had purchased an old funeral home and that's what got turned into the studio down there. We did Quake in that studio. It was on Magazine Street, and I think the building is still there. All the viewing rooms were different studios. So we had two control rooms. We had a big A room and a slightly smaller B room. And then one of the other viewing rooms was our live rehearsal room. We had a small PA in there. We kept all our live touring gear in there so that we could rehearse or just jam or do whatever. So we go back to New Orleans, and American was the guy who came to New Orleans for a few days, and at that point in Nine Inch Nails, uh, we were, uh, God, how do you explain it? You know, bars never close in New Orleans, you know, staying out and walking out of a bar and not realizing it's actually 10 a.m. was not uncommon, and so you'd sleep all day, and man, we just abused poor American. From moving to New Orleans, it not being an obvious kind of choice, I find it peaceful and beautiful and interesting and weird and kind of, um, very foreign to what I grew up in. Prior to the band signing on to the development of Quake, the iconic nail gun had already been implemented into the game by American McGee. McGee would soon after fly from its HQ to Nine Inch Nails' New Orleans based recording studio, Nothing Studios, to provide input, party with rock stars, and deliver builds of the game. Some of McGee's stories of the time easily could have been material for an X rated Cameron Crowe gothic coming of age story. As far as the iconic Nine Inch Nails branded ammo boxes go, those were later added as a joke, and to id's surprise, Trent Reznor loved it. The project required Reznor's dedication in entirely new ways. Trent Reznor recalls, quote, We spent an unbelievable amount of time on this. This all went down, and I was doing Marilyn Manson's Antichrist Superstar album, and I remember me and Twiggy from Manson's band upstairs in a room with a dat machine going, ugh, ugh. You almost throw up because you've done it a hundred times in a row. And it's fun to do, but it's an awful amount of work." End quote. Having never done Foley work before, Reznor relied on friends in the industry to figure out ways to produce the desired effects required for the game. According to Reznor, the list that was required for the game included somewhere around 1,000 sounds. Trent told Paul Seymour that, quote, I can't stab anybody and get away with it, probably. So I asked them how to do it. Take a head of lettuce and smash it on the floor with a knife. Oh, okay. End quote. The id team pivoted away from a completely medieval world, rather leaning into a macabre Lovecraftian universe controlled by a powerful force called Quake. This new Quake concept fused together elements of the initial sword and castle aesthetic with Doom's sci-fi horror influence. Surprisingly, musical hitmaker Trent Reznor was originally asked not to produce any traditional music compositions for the game. 
rather to focus on ambient sound design, fully voice work for the playable character and background drones. This approach could possibly be attributed to the creative's decision to shroud the ominous world design and the atmospheric art in a more mysterious auditory experience. But the truth is, Nine Inch Nails' is Nothing Records, being controlled by its parent label Interscope, also created real-world business and legal ramifications for the developers with every type of use of Nine Inch Nails intellectual property rights. This led to the developers' frustration with the label and the disagreements on how to best deliver the music via the modern technology that was afforded to Nine Inch Nails and the Quake team. Well, we're, we're still working on the sound effects, or I should say the, uh, the guys at Nine Inch Nails are working on the sound effects to refine them, make them better, get them um, completely finalized. Uh, we're probably not going to do anything with music. Um, having background music, we've, through our research, we found that a lot of people, who, the, the real serious Doom players, ended up shutting the music off. After a while, they just turned it all off. So with that in mind, uh, we have a choice. We can put music in, and uh, the, the size of the music files and the MIDI drivers to, to run them, um, or we can use that space for something else, like better AI or, or you know, proper uh, underwater death effects or something like that. In terms of musical compositions by Nine Inch Nails, McGee explains that id Software initially thought they could, quote, get away without it, end quote. Fortunately, the Nine Inch Nails frontman sat down the developers, telling them that music was really missing from the game. Reznor offered to work with them on the music. They obliged and the rest is history. According to Reznor, however, the conversation about the compositions happened in a slightly different way. Reznor explains, quote, the music came about because there was only a couple weeks left and they called up and said, hey, we're going to stream the music off the CD. Can you come up with some music for the game? Oh, you're kidding me. How much do you need? As much as you can give us. End quote. Throughout Quake's creation process, both teams at Nine Inch Nails and id Software were knees deep in work. In 1995, designer John Romero was overseeing Sandy Peterson and American McGee's level designs in Raven Software's Hexen, a title published by id Software while also utilizing its technology. Then uh, worked on Hexen and uh, Quake at the same time. It took about a year and a half for Quake. Romero also oversaw Ultimate Doom's retail release, all while familiarizing himself with the new level design system inside of Quake's 3D engine technology. On the other side of the process, Trent Reznor was overseeing the signing of bands to his record label. So uh, tonight, you've invited me to come down to the uh, Nothing Showcase, so the first big event for Nothing Records, your label. That's here in New Orleans. Yes. I'm um, very much looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I mean, I've, we've, Nine Inch Nails has toured with all three bands at different times. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all kind of were on tour and we just ride them through mm -hmm. to play together. That worked out real well. Good booking. Supporting the release of his massive hit album, The Downward Spiral, by co-headlining the outside tour with David Bowie and producing Manson's record, Antichrist Superstar. Its software would barely survive the chaotic nature of Quake's development. Yet despite the taxing work environment brought on by the challenges faced by the developers, Quake managed to leave an indelible mark on gaming. Through the eyes of Wired journalist Mark Laidlaw, his glimpse of Quake in production goes like this. Mark wrote, quote, Expelled from their cushy, distraction-filled offices, the whole team, level designers, artists, programmers, went to work in one large war room. Low tables lined the walls, every inch of counter space was occupied by computers and notepads, reference books, soda cans, and personal CD players. Almost every item not directly related to the completion of Quake was gone. The only privacy to be found was between the padded ear pieces of headphones, and things would stay this way until Quake was finished." End quote. Trent told Paul Semmel that, quote, "...they were working on Quake, so we started talking about my getting involved in that. Now, they weren't sure if the music would be streaming off the CD or in MIDI, but I told them I wasn't interested in doing it if it was MIDI." End quote. As a technical wizard and programming force behind id Software, the programmer and co-founder, John Carmack, guided Quake's teams into the future. Carmack's understanding of the rapidly evolving landscape of computing power and hardware 
empowered Nine Inch Nails to help usher in the advent of CD-ROM technology in gaming. The programmer explains, quote, while it is amusing to imagine Trent composing music for the chintzy FM synth sound cards of the day, we had a new tool available to us with the advent of CD-ROM drives. We could run full quality music in the background while the game played. Legal complications prevented the use of any vocals, but there was a wide open field for building the soundscape of the game." End quote. By ripping the soundtrack straight onto the disc, id gave Nine Inch Nails the green light to create a truly innovative gaming soundtrack. To Romero's disappointment, the Nine Inch Nails record label insisted that the developer avoid the inclusion of MP3s, which to the developer's dismay caused the game's soundtrack to only play if the disc was read in an optical drive. In a Quake postmortem with Tech Train, Romero details his frustration with the label. Quote, We finally got the tracks from Nine Inch Nails and a horrible decision from the record company. The music could not be an MP3 format, so the music had to be CD audio tracks burned onto a physical CD, playable only on CD. And this is the reason why none of the music played. While people played the game, they would have had to leave the CD in the CD player all the time." End quote. The challenges of scoring a video game like Quake present themselves in unusual ways. Chris Vrenna describes the process of learning the new form of writing, saying that, quote, "...game music is challenging on a couple of different levels. It's not a traditional song. It's not verse, chorus, verse. You also don't have any lyrics, so it's all instrumental music. But back then, it was something new for us." End quote. Nine Inch Nails' job in part was to protect the player, the goal being not to overwhelm players with too many musical distractions. Tight corridors, buzzing ambient machines, and bullets firing could easily be enough to hold a player's attention. There'd be no need for non-stop wall-to-wall -wall music. Vrenna told Kevin Keating that, quote, We learned a lot about how music had to sit within the confines of other sounds that are needed to play the game and not get your ass murdered immediately, end quote. With the Nine Inch Nails team having eyes on early builds, the music formed an inherent relationship to the gameplay and visual aesthetic of Quake. This allowed the developers to match corresponding music tracks with levels that fit together best. The push and pull of creative teams allowed the soundtrack to arrive in its ultimate form via multiple iterations and collaborative conversations. Trent Reznor describes the overall philosophical approach to the project as siding with the gamer, while also encouraging replayability. He says, quote, With the music of Quake, there was the approach it's dark, depressing, dingy, kill everything tense. Okay, what films have that same sense of dread? The decision on my part was not to make it amped up, so I kept everything subtle so you wouldn't get sick of the second time you play the game. But it would set up elements of tension, and because it was off the CD, it could be as many instruments as I wanted. It could be an orchestra, it could be one thing. That was a huge relief, though they were always siding on the side of gameplay over, say, having the shotgun sound in stereo. But then they would be, the game is about playing the game, end quote. With the affordance of space, Nine Inch Nails spread out in their converted funeral home recording studio, Nothing Studios. Chris Vrenna describes the layout that the band was using at the time, saying, quote, we had three different rooms working. Trent was in the main room, I was in the back room with Sean Beaven, our engineer from forever, and upstairs we had Charlie Klauser and Danny Lohner. They were up in Charlie's little room working on stuff. And the idea was to just generate as many of these ambient and scary but interesting and cool sounds that we could create, and then we'd bring them all together. And the other thing about games is that you write twice as much music as gets used for one reason or another. So we're working in all these teams coming up with stuff and we'd send id stuff and get their feedback." End quote. Beyond the studio, the band would employ their downward spiral techniques of taking their portable DAT machine to real-world environments, returning with the sounds and spreading them across samplers, allowing the musicians to pitch the unique soundscapes as if they were conventional instruments. They'd also produce unique digital distortion with the Zoom 9050, opting for strange, raw, and unique guitar tones over the classic tube amps often preferred by gear purists. A proud and reflective Chris Brenna describes the musical timelessness of the soundtrack stating, quote, those quake beds are some of the coolest and scariest when you listen to them now. They still hold up. There's not a lot going on in them. There's not a whole lot happening. They're not excessively layered with stuff. Things come in at the right moment and they build and ebb and flow. They stay really subtle. 
I think that's one of the reasons why they hold up so well. They're not so overdone that it becomes a cliche or something else. McGee's view on the legacy and importance of the soundtrack is best captured by YRB Magazine. The developer succinctly captures the music's essence saying that, quote, those visits to New Orleans resulted in a collection of sound effects and music which lived out on the edge of what could be done with organic and meaty sounds in those early days of digital music. In much the same way, the Doom and Quake games pushed the boundaries of what the technology was capable of to render pixels representing the darkest depths of horror and pain. Earlier games and music lacked the fidelity to move you emotionally in the way Quake and its soundtrack did, and later offerings became almost too literal too shiny, too real. Reflecting on the unfortunate departure of John Romero, John Carmack writes, quote, Quake turned out to be a very difficult project to ship. Due to both scope, ambition, and internal issues, the Rockstar game developers broke up at the end of it with the exit of co-founder John Romero. Still, by almost everyone's account, it is among the most influential games ever made, and it was a formative experience for a great many of the developers building the hits of today. Quake is a really great multiplayer game. But uh, I really like to play single player stuff and I really wish that I had spent more time doing, doing uh, better design on the single player game. But it was, it was you know, the situation and everything. Um, that was probably the biggest mistake. Trent's love of the Quake series didn't end with Quake 1. He even joked that his album was delayed in part to Quake 2 having been released in 1997. Via a conversation with Insight Games, Reznor told the team at id, quote, thanks for putting out Quake 2. It delayed the last album. Reznor even added for clarity, but it's just a hobby. It's not one that overtakes my life. Me too, Trent. Me too. I can stop at any time. Thank you for watching. This has been the Yeti Den. If you like videos like this, then please like and subscribe. I will talk to you guys later. Bye.